So you know how they're bringing back all this old IP? Like if I go out now, the Gen Z kids are dressed how I dressed in high school. And it's like, Stussy's huge again. And you know, we, we got, we got guests. We got Tommy Hilfiger. We got, you know, all these people coming back from the grave. One set of IP that I know we all would love to bring back. It's like there's maximum value in scale to the moon. Celebrity deathmatch. I just think claymation I, as an art has a, just underappreciated. You could spend 80 hours making one scene of like, or I forget, I forget what it would be. It would be like Britney Spears fights, you know, the Backstreet Boys yeah. zombie apocalypse oh, ghost, yeah. you know. Yo, I heard Ty Lopez just is like rolling something out in the NFT space with this. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Wow. Well, celebrity death NFTs. <laughs> and it's, a, <laughs> it's like faces of death. Meets NFTs and clay. Wow. Sponsor, yeah, sponsored by Radio Shack. Also a real throwback, Face <laughs> of Death. That, the, the, by the way, kids, anyone who's like under 30, the internet was the real Wild West when we were with like E-Bombs World, Face of Death. There was some wild... E-Bombs World. Uh, <laughs> oh, the, the internet. You know, this, the, this, this was videotape era. I remember I had a choice. I had like $20 and I could buy an and one mixtape on VHS Ooh. or I could buy like a Faces of Death VCR. I chose the and one mixtape. says a lot about me and I actually appreciate that decision. You yeah, know what I would good, do? Good I took my ten dollars allowance, or took my twenty dollars allowance every week, and I went and I bought bootleg Dragon Ball Bullfights. GT and oh. Dragon Ball Z tapes <laughs> when I was like oh. nine. Every week it would be three. It was ten bucks each or three for twenty, and they were just full on bootlegs. And I was madly in love with Dragon Ball GT and Dragon Ball Z. So anyway, and that's the pot. I, and that's that. the pot. No great transition <laughs> into. And to this of uh, this topic of like free game about how to run compliant ads for non-compliant products and industries, um, you know, in the group so if you chat were selling we bootleg Dragon Ball Z DVDs, how would you sell th the advertising? This would be a great. Ooh, that's a twist. That actually is the transition. If I were selling bootleg Dragon Ball Z DVDs, I would probably start an email list that had to do with Dragon Ball Z, and then in the email sell you those DVDs. And so, candidly, I used to do this for a company I owned a piece of, and I ran uh, uh, called Kanuka. And at the time, you couldn't do CBD advertising online. And so basically all the landing pages and all the ad copy, we could never mention hemp, CBD, cannabis, anything like that. We would talk about green and holistic and health. And then we would get you in and all the ads would get approved that way. And then when you come on board later on in an email sequence, or we could bring you to a different page that would talk about, about hemp and CBD. And the reason this has come up is because recently I've seen a lot of ads on TikTok for this drink called Can. And anyone who doesn't know the cannabis industry, Can is a THC infused uh, sort of cannabis drink. Microdose um, beverage. Microdose beverage. Thank you. Um, I actually like it. Um, I like the drinks. Um, not necessarily Can, but I actually do like the blood orange. But anyway, the ad is literally just uh, you know someone talking about how calm they get from the drink and how great it is, and then you click on it, and there's an email sign up to learn more. And I would bet my bottom dollar that as soon as you sign up for the email. That is when they start telling you about the THC and start trying to direct you towards dispensary to purchase, um, because there's no way so, TikTok is allowing you to run ads for THC. So that's my bit. I think this is particularly interesting, just because uh, you know this is not compliant on all of the platforms, but TikTok in particular is super aggressive ad about not allowing any sort of cannabis. Right, like like your your video, your content will get removed, your account will be shadow banned like immediately for even like even not just talking about it, but just like mentioning it or having an image that, that shows it in your video. And so to be, to be running one of these ads in TikTok and getting away with it is like, I like, it's kind of shocking. And the, the creative that they're using in the ad shows like the can says cannabis on it. I don't understand how TikTok's uh, filters haven't picked it up yet. It's, it's like the most aggressive one that I've seen of all these types of campaigns. And it's happening in the platform that is the most aggressive against it. I doubt it'll last. All right. So I'll, I'll put two pieces of free game out there for if you are selling any kind of prohibited products or products that have a tough time selling online. And the first is to build on what we saw with Can, where they're running an ad that takes you to an email. You know, this is something that a lot of cannabis companies I saw were doing early out. So Old Pal did this, Stizzy did this, where they would just build a separate account purely for their merchandise and run their Facebook and Instagram ads there to sell their merch. And they probably lost money on the acquisition of that considerably, but at least they offset it by selling something. And they did that to get followers onto these accounts, to introduce people to the brand and to get email signups. And then from there, from selling them lifestyle content and merchandise, they have a basis because they can't run ads in any other way. They do it from separate accounts and it would be like, you know, the old pal merchandise factory or whatever it is. And this is a great way to get around those existing regulations by selling a compliant product. The second thing that James's point is that it's not just the email addresses that you get 
that are marketable, but other people's email addresses are marketable too. If you have an email list, you own it to some degree, to the degree that, you know, whoever your service provider is, as long as you're abiding by their terms of service, you're okay. So something that we used to do in a previous industry that I worked in is we would actually buy a lot of political lists because political lists are always for sale. And so we would get tea party lists all the time because the tea party was thirsty for dollars and had a ton of reach and a rabid fan base. And we would be buying direct email blasts, cost a couple thousand bucks. You could get like 50, 60,000 uh, person sends. And we would do lead generation for these products that we couldn't run typical ads on. And this is a, still like a hack to this day, whether it's with just buying paid email from, you know, forum newsletters or whether it's political lists or whether it's, you know, kind of any magazine or thing that's out there. That's a great acquisition channel to be able to do for things that will be prohibited from normal advertising circumstances. Shout out Tea Party. If I was running ads like this right now, I <laughs> think... they still around? I, I think my call to action would be to a Telegram or a Discord. Um I, I would definitely maybe? experiment with that. But I, I think that there's really interesting stuff happening with that. And then especially in this vein where, sure, you can get an th email through to them, but you can't do SMS. You can't really be very, very you know, clear about what you're actually advertising on the landing page, much less the creative. Um, I've been thinking about that a lot with Telegram, uh, in particular for a, a hemp, a farm bill hemp related project uh, that uh, that Oren and I have been kicking around. Um, yeah. Uh, well, but, but so still, you know, speaking of that, uh, Go ahead, James. No, I was going to say, I think that there's, you, you touched on SMS. And it was interesting because I think SMS is still slept on a lot by people. Um, and partially because they don't know how to do it correctly. And it seems more expensive. Um, it is more expensive in an email. And um, you are sort of much more at the whim of, of the telecom companies than you are with, with email. Um, but I do think what's interesting about the SMS stuff in terms of a quick free game from that is that if you do capture people onto a text message list, is not to throw i'm sure i'm sure you guys are homies with the with the amuse team but if you like the way that amuse runs ads runs sms marketing to me it's from a new phone number yeah. every day because i'm sure it's com completely getting shut down nonstop, and it's literally spam like breaking can spam laws and compliant for selling i think federally legal drugs through text message but whatever um so I'm but amuse I'm is my guys i will accept no slander shout out shout out shout out the boys no, they're doing I, I what they got to to survive out here in these streets. Dude, that's fair. That's fair. And Orange got and Orange got their back. You know, sponsor the pod. Amuse. I'm <laughs> down. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Alex, what's up, my guy? You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> no, we'll take literally I, any check. On the real though, like you could tell your guy Alex, like I could sit with him for five minutes, and their strategy would be better. Candidly, when SMS needs to be personal, when you open a text message, the only people you get texts from are people that you know, right? And email is very different. Email is a really loud space where there's tons of spam. There's tons of promotional stuff. Text message, you go into my phone. I, I do not want you to feel, I do not want to feel like I am one of a million people on a list. In fact, it angers me. Whereas email, I might just move on from. You're special, I, James. You, no, I think that, the, oh, hypothetically, I think that, I, no, but I do think <laughs> that the way that you do SMS correctly is for your best customers. You make it bespoke and you make it much more tailored to them. And you will get much more, much more, much more efficacious results than if you just send a, a blast in the way you do with email. And I think that most people don't yeah, recognize that, that that's the way to do SMS. And it's funny because actually when we were doing, um, I was doing marketing in the same space with text message and the most effective things that we did, the entire automation was from a person. So you'd opt in a text and then it would come, a text would come from Sydney was the, the person who was an actual person there. We used her name and it would be welcoming you to the store introducing you to it. When you got the text, it would then say, Hey, you know, it's, and we changed people and things like, Hey, it's Alexa. And, you know, I just want to let you know, we have blank and blank in stock now at blank, but at least having some level of personalization. And it's shocking to me because I sign up for everything I possibly can just to get as much Intel, what brands are doing, how few people have that personalization layer. And this ties to another software. Really like, I really am a huge fan of the live recover software that voyage bought. Um, and I use it in multiple stores. I actually just turned it on the store last week and pulled it up. And in the first week, we had closed four additional sales that had 90 text message conversations. And we were offering only $10 off. And this is a store that does, you know, average transactions like $500, but we have really low margin. And so we had, uh, and because they do transactional text where a real person will then text to somebody and engage with them, answer basic questions, and it's such a useful tool, but it's even more useful. We can go read that history of what all those text messages look like inside our dashboard and actually see what questions are people asking? What objections do they have to buying? And so I was able to go through 90 of those 
test to actually see what happens and then give the agents at Live Recover answers to those questions. And they just do abandoned carts. But the future of that for any level of transaction, like I don't want to wait on hold on a phone. I don't want to submit like some sort of form, but I will happily text with a human being about buying something. Maybe I'm not every customer, but I do think it's an extremely underappreciated niche. I think it's something that Colin and I have both had on our tweet list of things we said we should build in is an SMS, SMS agencies. And I know James agrees. I think it's just a massive uh, like social selling, you know, opportunity that entrepreneurs can grab. So I think to, to loop this back around to the uncompliant industry. So SMS, I think this, this entire dynamic here where these basic channels for normal businesses are not available to cannabis, which is obviously still federally illegal, um, but is pretty rampantly legal uh, recreationally in a lot of States. And so in the case of uh, James's experience with Amuse, Amuse is, is using uh, the only cannabis friendly SMS platform that I know of, which pretty much is friendly by hot swapping numbers and avoiding keywords and having like a really limited UI and like shout out to the to the the good folks over at Happy Cabbage. It's it's pretty archaic and basic because they're Great, working a lot more on making sure that you can get a text out than they are on making sure that it's really fantastic and usable. Um, and so the uh, uh, we've used it a decent amount and the the text that you get are reflective of the platform that you're working with i don't see any limitations on why they couldn't slide slide uh <clears throat> you know names in there and whatnot but the numbers uh the numbers changing are, are going to be the nature of the beast but I that's think, not because... your problem if you're cb2 right and you're sending yeah, us to tell a spam absolutely and just firing yeah. away yeah totally which uh so i get uh rag and bone rag and bones sms is like borderline Dude, spam I, I and it's bizarre for bone? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's bizarre for, uh, for a relatively premium brand to just like, they just hammer it. It's, it's crazy. And, and I think the mo more interesting pieces is it's not that good. Like they send cart abandonment with a broken cart link and they send, they send me, you know, Oh, that product you were looking at is back in stock and it's not in stock in my size. It's like pretty rude. Well, James, pretty didn't you have like a horrible experience with rag and bone customer service too? Like is rag and bone just oh, like yeah. sorting rag and bone? I had a terrible, I had a terrible customer service experience with rag and bone in terms of like my ability to return things, how long they took to send me. They, I tried six times or five times to get them to send me the return label. It was chaos. But I do want to say real quick about, you know, candidly, I've been, you know, buying non-compliant products through SMS for as long as I can remember. I mean, that's the OG way that I was buying weed back in the day, right? Was I going to, you know, you text the dealer. I gonna, is, I is, this, is, is James the real Dread Pirate Roberts? Is this coming out on, <laughs> on, on, on the pod, live on the pod? <laughs> no, but I used to, I used to, I used to text the number. I used to text the beeper and I get a call back from Cartoon. It was called Cartoon Network. It was a delivery service in New York. It got shut down years ago. And it was in New York Times. It was a big deal. And basically, you would get these 50s. We're, I was cracking up about this back in New York last week because me and my friends were talking about how we used to spend like 100 bucks on like an eighth of weed. And it came in a, like a, it would come in a, a, gla a plastic cube. So it was clear. So you could see it. It didn't crush it. It was hard. And then there would be a lottery ticket with it to come with it. And then it was inside a sealed plastic bag. So, but every, everyone came with a lottery ticket. And that's how I knew it was real cartoon. And the James, how many SIM it. cards do you have in your house right now? <laughs> None, because all I have is iPhones now, man. But back in the day, a whole bunch of sims. All right. Um, but no, Good so answer. I do. Good so the, the I think the the sum it up. There's a million reasons to have your own email list. We could go into that a whole bunch another time. But if, especially if you're playing around with products or marketing copy that might not fit in with what an ad network like Facebook or TikTok is interested in, then probably the best way to do this to get around that is to run ads that bring people into your email list. And then from there, they're in your world and you can say whatever you want. Amen.